Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm Jack Nolan, joined once again by the head coach of the Fighting Irish. And Mike, your team has now won five of seven games and accomplished something no other Notre Dame team has ever done before. You defeated both Kentucky at Rupp Arena and Duke at Cameron Indoor Stadium in the same season. Well, we're playing well, Jack, and, and we've kind of found something a little bit, and it's exciting because this group has continued to work and took punches early in the season against the toughest schedule we've ever put together. But that's one of the things that I talked to him about when we got to Durham after a disappointing night in Atlanta against Georgia Tech was forget the league record, forget the standings. If you can win in Durham and you've already won in Lexington, Kentucky, I don't think a Notre Dame basketball team's ever going to do that again. At least, Jack, I won't be alive to see it. <laughs> I don't think I will be either, Mike. And I know some will right, rightfully point out that both programs are struggling this season. They don't prepare the way you do or even I do, but Kentucky is playing with three projected NBA picks, including two projected lottery picks. Duke has five McDonald's All-Americans plus another guy who would have been a McDonald's All-American if he hadn't missed his senior year of high school basketball season. So my point is, these are two really talented teams that you beat on their home courts. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you know, we, we, you can argue about an asterisk, no crowd, whatever, you know, we're, we're playing with the rules that are set up this year. And, and uh, I'm really proud of our group to be able to win in both those buildings. And uh, yeah, you're right. Both groups are extremely talented, Kentucky and Duke. They've not found their rhythm yet, but I wouldn't be surprised that both of them do because they have gifted players. And you did play in front of, I think, 3,000 at Kentucky. Now, I know in that building, it doesn't look like much, but that was your most intense road atmosphere until you went to Georgia Tech. And Cormac Ryan, in particular, had a tough game at Georgia Tech, and he wasn't able to get a shot off at the end when he seemed to lose track of the clock. You elected to put him back into the starting lineup at Duke, and he responded with a career-high 21 points in the first half alone to keep you in it. He finished with 28. He did lots of tough stuff as well. Why would you make that decision to put Cormac back into the starting lineup? Well, there was no question that, you know, at the end of the Georgia Tech game that he didn't get a shot off and passed it up and just felt like he cost his team. And, and I don't want a young man feeling like that. We're all in this together. Um, you know, we turned the ball over nine times in the second half against Georgia Tech's press. That's why we lost. And that was collective responsibility, including the head coach, maybe not getting us in the right pressure set. Um, and my feeling was, you know, to get him mentally right moving forward and for us as a group to move forward, let's start him. And man, did he respond in Cameron. I think you can make the argument that the foundation of the win at Duke was actually laid in part in the loss at Georgia Tech. Well, you played superbly well in the first half and you shot it really well in the second half. But the Yellow Jackets press got to you in the second half and the turnovers led to a real gut punch of a loss, but it didn't lead to a loss in your team's sense of confidence. You know, that's what I've been really thrilled about this group, you know, not only reacting after Atlanta, and you're right, we have 50 points and a half at halftime. We can't handle the ball well enough against their press. I tip my cap to the Georgia Tech home atmosphere. They actually had one in a band, and I think it really helped their team and it kind of rattled us a little bit simply because we haven't played in road atmospheres. They've been empty gyms, you know, kind of quiet situations. Um, but this group has been very resilient. You know, we took punches through the non-league. We started 0-5. And, and where they are with their mental and physical toughness right now, I'm really pleased because it was something we had to get tougher mentally and physically. And, and you know, they're smart guys. We challenged them, and they've responded to date. You know, ever since you at times started playing Nate Lyshevsky and Juwan Durham on the floor at the same time, it's been a struggle to get into an offensive rhythm, to find the right spacing for those guys. But you've done it in recent weeks. And at Georgia Tech, they combined for 45 points and nine rebounds. I think they've um... – They've found a way to really play off of each other. We like throwing it to the post to Juwan and working off of him or letting him go to work to score. 
Um, and Nate has found a good rhythm playing outside the arc when Jawan's posting. We know he can shoot the ball, but what he's done this year, he's added that physical drive where he goes and finishes and gets fouled. And, and certainly then back on the defensive end, especially when we're in zone with those two in, we're bigger and longer, and, and that helps us. So, you know, those two together are key for us. It's just finding the flow throughout a game. What's working and what do we do at this point? Two bigs or four guards? Always a dilemma we talk about as a staff throughout timeouts. It was another terrific week for Prentice Hub. In the two games, he scored 30 points and dished out 18 assists, and he took over the Duke game in the last six and a half minutes, doing just about everything that needed to be done to ensure Notre Dame's second all-time victory at Cameron Indoor Stadium. I love coaching this young man, and, and you know how I have, you know how I am about my guards. They're all like sons to me. Probably that's why all the big guys are pissed off at me because, you know, they're my <laughs> gold boys. Um, but he, he's, he's always had a special big game vibe about him. I saw him make two threes in the fourth quarter as a ninth grader at Gonzaga against DeMatha in a high school championship game when he should be scared to death. And I said, there's something about this guy. And now he's gotten older and physically stronger. His basketball IQ and court vision is off the charts. But what he has that you cannot coach, I want it when the lights are bright. I will take the big shot. I will make the play. I'm unafraid. And he gives us some fearlessness um, that maybe we haven't had in the past. Of course, Cormac and Prentice, huge reasons why you won at Duke. But to be honest, all seven guys in your rotation played really, really well. So rather than me throw their names at you, talk to us about the other guys and what they did and what you really were impressed by in that game. Let me start off by saying Nick Jogo's role is so important to us. Number one, as a leader and a very vocal captain. And then defending and coming in and helping us move the ball and fitting in. And I, he has played his role fabulously. I, I am so proud of him. He's found a niche, and he's so key to us winning five out of seven. And, and so that has really been certainly instrumental to us. Um, there's no question Dane Goodwin um, – has stuck his nose in there and been more of a warrior on a nightly basis. We know he can score. He's made big progress defensively, staying in front of athletic ability, and he rebounds for us. And I thought Cormac Ryan, we said, had a great – Trey Wirtz was in a great rhythm, uh, especially at Duke. And I hope maybe we found something there, both Cormac and Trey. Trey is really another point guard for us, handles the ball, makes decisions off the ball screen. It frees Prentice up to kind of be a scoring guard uh, at times. So uh, those seven have been our guys. They know they're going to play. You never know who's going to finish. You know you're starting a group, but they may not be the group that finishes. And you kind of see where the wind's blowing and who's playing well, and you ride that down the stretch. You know, you and I, when we were together to do these shows with – sometimes had little uh, mini dual counseling sessions for each other before we started. I think we frustrated the, the crew so much because we talked so much. We don't do that much anymore, but we're still on the same page because Nick Jogo is our guest on today's show coming up in a little bit. So that should be fun. We still have that chemistry, Jack. You know that. <laughs> we always will. I'll be texting you next year from wherever I may be. Folks, our friends at NECA want to remind you that they are continuing their efforts to make our community brighter. It's what NECA electrical contractors do every day through donations, volunteer efforts, and by training the next generation of electrical workers through apprenticeship programs. The NECA contractors and electrical workers of Local 153 preparing for a brighter tomorrow. When we come back, we will break down Notre Dame's two-point loss at Georgia Tech and historic win at Duke. But first, this time out on the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireRack.com the ultimate in contactless tire buy. It's time now for our game breakdown brought to you by our friends at Meyer. For the third straight game, you got off to a terrific start at Georgia Tech with your two big guys, Durham and Leshesky, combining for your first 11 points to stake you to an 11-2 lead. 
Well, I love how we started. We were in an offensive rhythm. We ended up getting into a zone defense that I think stalled them a little bit. They are a gifted offensive team, as we saw in the second half. But when you can get off to a good start on the road, it sure does make you feel good. And it takes, for the first time, a crowd out of the game. Another guy who has been playing consistently outstanding basketball for you is Prentice Hub who delivered his fifth double-double with 15 points and 10 rebounds against the Yellow Jackets. He has found a rhythm using the weapons around him. He's made the commitment on the defensive end and has been better there. Uh, And as we've seen many, many times, he is a fearless guy down the stretch because he'll want to make the play in game situations. It was as complete an offensive performance as I think a team can have in the first half. 66% shooting from the floor, 6 of 13 from three-point land, and 24 points in the paint with just two turnovers as you built the 17-point lead. It was still a 15-point lead at halftime, and I know you guys felt good going into that locker room. You know, we did, but I always worry, especially against Georgia Tech on their home floor. They had not lost there. And eventually, I thought they would get their offense going. What knocked us on our heels a little bit is their press and their pressure in the second half. We did not handle it well. Two turnovers at halftime, nine in the second half, really was the difference in the game. And then a home crowd got into it. And it helped Georgia Tech. And I think it flustered us simply because we haven't played in front of that many people and that kind of energy in a building all season because of COVID. And for folks who have never been there, I was first there on Ralph Sampson played for Virginia at Georgia Tech. It's a pit. Uh, it's a little less intimidating now than it was, but you even walked down that long ski jump like ramp to get in. And they not only had a crowd, which is right on top of you, but they had their band. I mean, they had, they were wearing masks with cutouts so that they could play the wind instruments. They had all their cheerleaders. They had all their pom-pom girls and they were all right on top and I could even tell from the the live video feed that I had in breaks that it really was just like a regular game and the crowd may have been small but it didn't sound that way you know and 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 it was kind of cool to coach in it I I know it affected us you know adversely and helped Georgia Tech but I've missed that I think our players missed that a band playing cheerleaders crowd. I mean, it was a little bit of the atmosphere that we have not had been able to experience because of the pandemic, Uh, but it certainly helped the home team and it flustered the road team and us. And and you know, Mike, it's human nature. When you coach a team, play for a team, announce for a team, root for a team, you look at a game through the lens of your team and you have a tendency, and I know your players do, the fans certainly do, to blame your team, to put all that blame on your team when you lose. But Georgia Tech play very well. And one guy in particular, I know you love older, veteran, gritty guards with talent. And Georgia Tech has one at Jose Alvarado. And he did a little bit of everything for them. 19 points, five of six, six rebounds, six steals. Fair to say he was the main catalyst for Tech's come from behind victory. Well, he's been their guy. Alvarado's had a great year, a first team all league kind of year. And and he does make them go, especially with how he can steal it and turn you over. You know, he gets deflections, and then he gets easy baskets for them. And the whole second half, it was transition defense for us. We were back on our heels, and they got to the rim, and the crowd got into it. And it was, again, them stealing it, us turning it over, not being strong with the ball, but Alvarado making big plays at key times. Now, they won it despite the fact that Your big guy, scoring big guy, Nate Leshesky, was even better for you in the second half than he was in the first half, scoring 14 of his game-high 27 points in pressure-packed situations. And, you know, he got a lot of those with one big. You know, Jawan was out, and we spread the floor around him. He got a lot of slips off the ball screen. Prentice saw him, and, you know, and then he got some threes, too, and they lost them in transition. Um, No, he's playing well. He's playing confident. And and for him – You know, he's had some games where he's not scored, but he's rebounded and done the dirty work, and then he comes back, and he's just taken what the defense gives him. He's not forcing stuff. That's why his percentages are flat out off the charts, because he doesn't force anything. 
Now you're down too late. Lyshevsky comes up with another big play, a big block, and you've got a chance. But Tech does a really great job getting back in transition. They actually triple-teamed Hub, and then DeVoe closes out really well on Ryan. He was about a foot behind the arc, and you end up without a shot which I know Cormac was really beating himself up about after the game. Do you know what, Mike? I'm not making excuses, but even if he took the shot, it's a tough shot. Tech did well there. Yeah, they, they did. And, and, and I give our guys a lot of credit. We weren't very good defensively in the second half, but we got enough stops and we got the big one. We didn't want to foul. There was a differential in the clock. We did not want to foul. We knew we'd get it back. Nate makes a great play. Now here we come in a scramble situation with a chance to tie or win it. Prentice, I know, looked at everything and was going to try and do something, but you're right. There were three guys running at him. You hit Cormac, you know, it's going to be a tough one. He's got to get it off up over the top of a six, seven guard. And he just thought there was more time when he kicked it back. And he was devastated in the locker room. You know, it took him 15 minutes, you know, just to get his head up. And and I hate to see that with young men because he worked his butt off. He did everything to help us get to that point. And, and luckily, fortunately, you know, he's got great teammates. Like the one thing this group has done, because we've had a lot of situations where you had your heart broken or you've had disappointment or a guy feels he's let the other guys down and those guys pick him up. When your teammates and your culture that you've created can pick up guys that uh, have their head down or feel like they cost a the game, th th then you're more than halfway back if you can get that part of your culture. And, and I do believe we really have strength in that department. So after the heartbreaking 82-80 loss at Georgia Tech, you stayed on the road. You headed up to Durham for a rematch with the Blue Devils. And unlike your previous three games, Mike, this one did not start well for Notre Dame. Duke came out and made eight of their first 11 shots, including all four three-point attempts to take a 20-8 to eight lead just six minutes into the game, forcing you to call a timeout, and you did not hide your displeasure with your guy. Well, a little bit of it was you knew Duke was going to – they had a disappointing loss at home to North Carolina. They were going to come out of the gate. I thought we were ready to play, watching us in warm-ups the day before in practice, and I think most of it was Duke just playing out of their mind and not missing a shot for a while. But it gave me a chance to kind of, how do I want to phrase this, light up our guys a little bit in a timeout and maybe wake them up a little bit more. To their credit, we came out and methodically played basketball like we've been playing to get it to five points at halftime. But 50-45, you knew we're going to have to score to get out of that building because they're going to score. Fortunately, we were able to get to 93, and that's hard to beat anywhere. Now, Duke would expand that lead after the timeout to 15, but then Cormac Ryan absolutely caught fire. I've been doing Notre Dame games since 1982. I don't think I've seen a better individual performance in a half. In the final 13 minutes of the half, Cormac scored a career-high 21 points in the half alone to help you cut the lead from 15 down to two at halftime. What a way for Cormac to bounce back from a rough game at Georgia Tech. I, I thought he'd bounce back like the high character, tough guy that he is. And, um, you know, I, I thought he was in that rhythm that we've seen in practice. He can really get going offensively and we've seen spurts of it, but he can really, really get going. And what's lost in it is he was really defending. I mean, the charge that he takes, he rotates over and takes a charge. He was rebounding. And he's always defended and rebound all season. I think he's starting to get a feel of how to just play simpler and calmer on the offensive end and not over dribble. And when he has a little bit of room to get a shot off with that stroke that he has, we want him to shoot it. He's learning the he's learning how the guards have the green light in this system. Cormac ended up with a career-high 27 points, including four threes, an assist, three steals, a block shot, and a couple of rebounds. But he didn't force anything in the second half, and he didn't have to. A total of six guys scored at least seven points in the second half, including Durham and Hub, who each had 10 points in the half. And I give Cormac credit and our guys. I think this group has learned, okay, uh, if we're going, I don't have to force anything. 
and and we were going collectively more in the second half. We weren't having to ride Cormac Ryan. And to his credit, he continued to just defend and rebound and pass and cut and move and maybe be almost a little bit of a decoy in the second half because, you know, Duke talked about him at halftime. I want to talk a little bit about a guy just about nobody talked about much after the game, and that's Dane Goodwin. He reminds me of David Graves. I I always used to say David Graves was a stat sheet stuffer, and Dane is the same. He had 12 points in this game, including a couple of threes, and at just 6'6", he was your leading rebounder with seven. You know, it's the one thing about him. He's always had the instinct to rebound. He's become more of a guard uh, as far as being good with the ball, and, and we knew he could always shoot it and score it. And where he had to get better was the defensive end. And he had some plays where he stayed in front of a very athletic driver and cut him off and made it a tough shot, which has helped us, and it's, I think, helped him become a better all-round player. Now, Cormac kept you in it in the first half, but it was Hub who took over in the final six and a half minutes, scoring nine of his 15 points, dishing out three of his eight assists, and hitting a huge, deep dagger that apparently a certain radio announcer lost his mind over with 37 seconds left to help put this game away. It was one of your greatest got it in the history of got it. Let me put it that way, when Prentice nailed that thing. But I think there's where we see apprentice hub, unafraid, fearless, um, the lob to Juwan Durham on the roll. That is a courageous play in time and score. I don't think I would have the courage to do that. I'd want to play, make a safer pass, but I love his fearlessness. And he was fearless at the end of the Georgia Tech game, trying to get to the rim and couple rolled off. He bounces right back the next game and says, I will do it again. The step back three, when he let it go, I'm thinking this one's going because we had a good karma and vibe about us. Uh, But a fearless young man loves the big moments. And as we know, uh, in this career that still has a lot of time left in it, he's delivered on a lot of big moment plays. And there's another guy who I know really pleased you with his play against Duke, and that's Trey Wirtz, who in the second half had five points, four assists, and three rebounds. He didn't turn the ball over the entire game. He's another point guard for you at times, but a point guard with height. He's a tough matchup. I I thought he gave us a great lift being able to use the ball screen and make plays. He had a couple drives. He's, he was better with the ball. We've been on him about not turning it over um, and being more physical. And as we said last week, he, we had him on getting his motor up, getting that motor up. Um, but he does help us when you have Ryan, him, and Hub all out there being able to make a play off a ball screen. It really gives you more weapons in playmaking ability. And I think Trey Wirtz now, after not thinking he had any chance of playing basketball this year and we got him eligible, is starting to find a rhythm at the right time. So the Irish fly home from Durham with a 93-89 win over Duke. Just Notre Dame's second all-time win at Cameron Indoor Stadium. We'll be back with more on the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireRack.com, right after this timeout. Hey, Notre Dame fans, Tire Rack is the presenting sponsor of the Mike Bray Show, and like the Irish, knows a thing or two about passion and performance. Their on-site test track is their home court, and they've got a playbook that includes safe, no-contact mobile installation in many areas. Get your tires right at TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. Graduate student and Irish captain Nick Jogo is playing the best and most consistent basketball of his Notre Dame career. In 15 games this season with two starts, he is averaging four and a half points and 3.2 rebounds in 18 and a half minutes of playing time per game. And he is compiling these numbers in impressive fashion, shooting 54% from the floor, 36% from three-point land, and dare I say, a perfect 12 for 12 from the free throw line. Off the court, Jogo earned a degree in management consulting from the Mendoza College of Business last May and is currently working toward an accelerated MBA from Mendoza. Mike, we talked privately about Nick, and I came away thinking you could not be more pleased with the way he has performed on the court and the way he has led both on and off the court. 
Well, let me start with the leadership and being a captain and a fifth year guy. He's really been a voice and he's been a great conduit for me to the guys to find out where we're at, where our head's at. He's even recommended things we should do in practice. And a guy that's been in the program five years, you value that feedback. Um, and then the role that he's carved out for himself to help us win. He, he is absolutely found how to help us win. Come in, defend, rebound. If he's got to score it, he'll score it move the ball. Um, it, it takes a great maturity and security to know this is what I do to help us win. And I do it all the time. They can rely on me. No one is doing his job more consistently than Nick Jogo. And he deserves a great senior year because he's been such a, a key guy for us and, and a team guy. Um, but uh, right now there is we can't do it without him. When we when he was injured in December, there's a reason why we really, really struggled and couldn't get over the hump when we didn't have him. Now, Nick, you've had flashes of brilliance throughout your career against North Carolina, your first year of action when you hit those two big threes, the 21 points you scored at Boston College, your second year of playing time. But this year you have been consistently a productive and played an important role in every game that you have played. What has led to this level of performance on your part? I think it just comes with, um, you know, being an older guy, like Coach said, been here in the program for five years, know how it works, and just kind of took a step back and needed to see what I needed to do to help the team win. And being able, you know, get those consistent minutes and knowing what is expected of me, I think I've been able to produce um, at a much more consistent level than, than in years past. <clears throat> Yeah, Nick, you've been you've been nobody's been more consistent than you. Um, talk a little bit about your role from your perspective as you watched us. You know, tell me, you know, how you prepare mentally uh, when yeah. you're sitting there and come off the bench. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's no secret that we have a bunch of guys who can score the ball, and you know, we're pretty offensively gifted. Um, so I know that you know, often I think sometimes we can get caught in a place where, you know, everybody kind of wants to score and the ball's not moving that much. And I'm a guy that, you know, I don't really need to go out there and score a ton of points. If the ball comes to me and I'm open and I'm in position to score, like coach said, I will, but I'm not someone that particularly like hunts a shot all the time. So I take pride in, you know, getting others involved and moving the ball and helping, helping our team score. And then defensively, I think I'm one of the better defenders on the team and I take pride in being able to defend at a high level, no matter if I'm guarding a guard or, um, or a foreman. I think that my ability to switch helps us a lot when I'm on the floor. <clears throat> you know, before the pandemic, you know, Nick, I was at practice a lot, not there as much this year, but what I really admired about what you did last year was in your then senior year, uh, you didn't play that much, but what you did do uh, was lead so much in practice. And I, I never got the, the sense um, that you were frustrated. You certainly never showed it. And you were so important to this team because I would see you on the bench, even if you weren't playing, telling guys, you got to be over there. Watch out for this. You need to do this. Great play. Mm -hmm. What is it about your personality where, where you seem to not have the reaction a lot of guys do where they worry more about how much they're playing as opposed to how well the team is playing? Yeah, I mean, I just – I have faith in myself and, you know, how things play out and things happen for a reason. I mean, you never know situations that I've been put in throughout my years and, you know, not getting playing time at certain moments and having to fight through things that might help me later on in future in life outside of basketball, being patient with things and, you know, being able to do my job. Um, but also I just, you know, everyone on our team works hard is, um, you know, has dreams and has hopes. And if other guys are getting opportunities, it's, I feel it's selfish of me to like, you know, kind of, be down and be negative towards the team because if I was out there, I would hate for somebody not playing to, you know, not have my full support. So I just, you know, do my best to cheer on the guys that are getting playing time while working hard myself to, you know, improve my situation as best as possible. You know, Jack, for five years, you know, all every season, Nick has been a total team guy and very supportive, even when he wasn't playing as much as he, he has wanted to. And, and, you know, a lot of respect for guys like that. You know, he has got a heck of an academic schedule with this accelerated program. And, and he handles that like a man. He handles his role like a man. He's really a young man in our program and a great role model for our young players. 
just pivoting a little bit off of basketball, Nick, catch us up on your family north of the border. How's everything up there in Canada? They're good. Just a little, a little hectic. Canada's in full lockdown. So there's really not much uh, people can do. It's just as if it was back in March, restaurants, everything is closed up. So my family and they both work in healthcare. So my mom and dad are just working kind of grinding away with all this stuff going on. My sister's in her last year of law school. So um, yeah, things are just going. Uh, they're, my parents are working, sisters, sisters in school. I, I keep in touch with them um, every night, FaceTime as much as I can, but they're doing good. You know, it's tough enough, Nick, dealing with the pandemic just with a regular job, but with your parents working in health care, how much more has it impacted them in their daily life than just dealing with the shutdowns? Yeah, I mean, it's challenging for sure. I can, I always talk to them after they get off their shifts at work, which is usually around like 3.35, and I can just hear in their voice that they're a little more tired than usual. On, on top of working longer shifts, they have to wear all that gear, which is pretty, pretty hard. Um, and they just, they work more often. There's just a lot of people calling in sick. So people have to cover other people's shifts. It's just, it's a lot of demand for healthcare workers. And my parents have, have fallen into that, but they're doing a great job there. You know, they're just like me. They put their head down and they work no matter what the circumstances. You know, Nick, the um, talk a little bit about our captains, you know, I, I think it's been an interesting mix of two fifth year seniors, you and Juwan, and Cormac, who just got eligible, that was voted a captain, and certainly Prentice, who's kind of been our quarterback. Talk a little bit about that that leadership group that we have. Yeah, I think um, us four guys have done a great job of leading, you know, with me and JD being here for a long time. We're kind of the older people of the team, the older presence who, um, who have a lot of respect in the locker room, you know, with our voices and what we have to say. With Cormac, um, you know, the fact that he's been here for a year and he's already been voted a captain says a lot. And, you know, the guys respect him and he has that kind of fire and edge to him, which is um, great for captains to bring. And then P-Hub, I mean, from ever since he was a freshman here and now a junior, the way he's progressed as a leader is great to see. Me and Juwan were actually talking about it. We love kind of the leader he's become. In timeouts, he starts, like, getting a hold of the guys and saying really important things. He just keeps us kind of locked in if we ever – um, stray from our focus, but he's, he's done out of all the captain. I mean, he's done an amazing job just progressing and being a really vocal and important leader for us. You know, Nick, uh, Chase Claypool got a lot of publicity for being Canadian and uh, playing for the Notre Dame football team, but you're the first Canadian to play for the Notre Dame basketball team. The first Canadian to start for the Notre Dame basketball team. Is there a certain sense of pride in that distinction for you? Yeah, I mean, it definitely definitely is, considering that, you know, there haven't been any uh, Canadian basketball players here at Notre Dame, so I like taking pride in that. But it's just, you know, Canadians come in America and trying to represent their um, their country as best as possible. And, you know, Chase did that at the football level, and I'm trying to do that at the basketball level. I just have one last question for him, Jack. Favorite Tim Hortons donut? <laughs> I got to go. I got to go with the original chocolate dip. Chocolate yeah. dip. <laughs> yes. That's there a good go. spot north of the oh, border, yeah. Jack. <laughs> I've heard of it, never had the, uh, the honor of being there, but uh, I'm going to have a little more free time next year. Maybe I'll have to uh, make yeah, a road trip. Out. <laughs> Nick, that's a good segue to favorite donut into the fast break questions, this little fast rapid fire question session that you have done so well on throughout your years here at Notre Dame. We'll begin mm -hmm. with your favorite all-time movie. Favorite all-time movie, Goodwill Hunting. First car you ever drove? Uh, 2012 Honda Civic. No, Honda Accord. Honda Accord. Favorite musical group or artist? Drake. Who was your role model? Um, my dad growing up. One thing the public would be surprised to learn about you? One thing. Well, actually, most people don't seem to know that I can speak four languages, so... Which four? four? But besides English, Macedonian, Serbian, Bosnian, and Croatian. Favorite NBA player? Used to be Manu Ginobili, currently in the league. Um, really haven't been watching that much basketball. Um, I like Joe Ingles. I'm a Joe Ingles fan. Favorite thing to do when relaxing? Watching Netflix or playing, playing some video games with the fellas. Favorite part of practice? Definitely just getting up and down, playing five on five, going live. Worst part of practice? Um, just the stretching because you just want to get into it and just roll. Best part of your game? I'd say my versatility. 
I remember when you called yourself very early in your career, the Swiss Army Knight. Yeah. I love that line. I really do. Yeah. Part of your game you need to work on. I still think I can improve on my ability to drive and take contact, finish with contact. City or place in the world you would like to visit? Um, Santorini, Greece. I've been there. Good place to visit. I want to go. <clears throat> What's better for you? A highlight film dunk, blocking a key shot, grabbing a big rebound, or knocking down a long three? You know, this year with, with, uh, with the rebounding, I'll say grabbing a key rebound, just snagging that down and securing something. One thing you always hear from Coach Bray in practice. Let's be good with it. The question I should probably stop asking because the answer appears to be obvious, but assistant coach who is most like Coach Bray. I feel like you have to say Bolanis, but I still don't know how, how similar, but Bolanis. <laughs> it does seem to be a – I think it's in the letter of intent uh, yeah, yeah. contract now that you have to answer that question. Must that answer way. Bolanis. <laughs> Give me a one, a one or couple word uh, response uh, to the uh, names of the other three uh, staff members. Scott Martin. Composed. Ryan Humphrey. Mm, I'm going to say funny. Coach Hump is funny. <clears throat> Harold Swanigan. A child. <laughs> oh, he's he's going to love that. <clears throat> Toughest place to play in the ACC. Um, well, with fans, Cameron. Without fans, yeah. not Cameron. <clears throat> Player on the team most like Nick Jogo. Oh, uh, this year I'd probably say either – probably maybe Nate. I know that the rooming arrangements have changed in the pandemic, but through your experience, who's been the best player to room with since you've been at Notre Dame on the road? Um, it was a little stint my junior and senior year that I was with Mooney. Me and him are super close. I got to say Mooney. Best defender on the team? I'd say it's a toss-up between me and Cormac. <clears throat> Toughest Notre Dame player to guard? Toughest Notre Dame player to guard. Um, depends, because I got guard. I got. I got to guard guards and bigs. Big. I'll say Juwan guard. Mm, Cormac. There's that versatility thing again. Yeah. <laughs> Best leaper on the team. Best leaper on the team. A healthy Robbie Carmody. Best dunker on the team. I'll say Juwan. Worst dunker on the team. Uh, Elijah Morgan. Best dresser on the team. I'd say myself. Worst dresser on the team. Worst dresser on the team. You know what? Nate Nate can't dress. I don't think he can dress. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he doesn't, I think he just doesn't care, so I'll go Nate. <laughs> Another category I should probably drop because it doesn't seem like this year's team sings a whole lot, but who's the best singer on the team? Oh, singer. Yeah, we really don't, but yeah. maybe, maybe Cormac? Is there a worse singer on the team? We're a singer. We'll just say, we'll just for the sake of, we'll just say Prentice. I have to, I have to throw his name in there. We'll just say Prentice. <laughs> <laughs> Best comedian on the team. Best comedian on the team. The, the duo of Tony and Matt. Those two guys together are hilarious. <laughs> and there's always a guy on every team, in every organization, who thinks he's funny and says stuff and laughs at his own jokes, but he's not funny. Is there yeah. somebody like that on this team? Well, my four years, it was a heavy favorite, TJ. He was he was consistently taking that role. But this year, I mean, E. Morgan can sometimes do it and maybe P. Hub. But other than that, they're not as bad as TJ. He was another level. And this final question has never been more appropriate since you are 12 for 12 from the free throw line. Free throw shooting competition. Who wins? You or Coach Bray. I think the numbers speak for themselves and go with me. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> right. right, Mike, he's going to be successful in the future, whether it's basketball, business, this guy's going to go a long way. The man's a winner. The man's a winner. Captain, uh, I'll see you later today. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Nick, it has been a pleasure to call your games and get to know you over the years. I know you're going to do, as I just said, great things in life. Thanks for taking the time to visit with us today. Yep. And congratulations on your retirement, Jack. Thank you. We will return to wrap up this week's Mike Brace show presented by Tyrac.com right after this time.
Rob Kurz was the captain of two of the most successful Big East teams in Notre Dame history. During his junior year, Kurz shared captain duties with Russell Carter and Colin Falls and helped lead the Irish to a fourth place finish in the Big East regular season with an 11-5 conference record. His senior year, Kurz became the first player in the Mike Bray era to serve as a solo captain and led the Irish to a 14-4 record, which tied Louisville for second place in the Big East standings. Pat Connaughton is the only other player to serve as a solo captain under Coach Bray. Kurz averaged 12.6 points and eight rebounds his junior season and 12.5 points and seven rebounds his senior season on the way to becoming a member of the prestigious group of players to score 1,000 points in a Notre Dame uniform. Kurz played five years of professional basketball, both in the U.S. and overseas, highlighted by the 40 games he played for the Golden State Warriors in the 2008-2009 season, a season that saw him start five games. Now in private business, Kurz took some time to catch up with Coach Bray earlier today. Rob Kurz, it's been too long. Great to see you. Um, hey, catch us up on your family. Um, I got to see you on the road the last time we were on the road recruiting. You and your and your son came by. and uh, But catch us up on the family and Philadelphia and your parents and the whole bit. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me, Coach. It's great to see your face again. Um, today's actually my oldest uh, fifth birthday, so Braden's five. He's five. Um, we're down here uh, at my parents in Florida just doing a little getaway, get in the sun, get the kids in the pool. Um, my daughter Haley will be two next month, and then Mary's due uh, April 30th with our third. So the family's growing, and the and the and the chaos is uh, getting more and more uh, crazy every day. Well, we're so darn proud of you here. Uh, you know, you were one of those guys that <clears throat> used basketball, and it didn't use you. You know, you you played, you played professionally, you played in the NBA, and then when it was time to move on, you didn't reluctantly leave. You said it's time to roll and you've rolled. And tell us a little bit about your business ventures that have been so successful. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we all come to Notre Dame, right? Is you get the perfect balance of top tier academics um, that sets you up in your post career. And, you know, then we get to play for you and the play in either the Big East or the ACC. So it's the perfect combination for, you know, setting you up for the rest of your life. Um, in terms of my, you know, day-to-day -day business, I'm on the board of a, uh, of a, comp of a startup. Um, and then uh, we formed a partnership. We're doing some boutique investment banking. Um, we're advising a company right now in Korea um, that wants to go public in the U.S. Um, so we're serving as their advisor. Um, they're looking at either uh, doing a SPAC transaction or uh, going public. Um, you know, we do some capital raising. Um, you know, so we're, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, and I really think that, you know, my Notre Dame education has really kind of set me up for what I'm doing now. And I'll tell you, I, I lean on the Notre Dame network, uh, you know, all the time in my, my business career. So um, I'm constantly, um, you know, living the embodiment of, of the Notre Dame kind of athletic experience. It's good to hear that you've uh, take advantage of the network. We certainly sell that when we recruit you, and uh, it's great to see you to do it now. I know you've watched this this year. Tell me what you think about a guy that gets compared to you a bunch, Nate Lashevsky. Everybody, when he started growing up, what, what do you think about Nate in the comparison to Rob Kerr's? You know, it's 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 funny. You know, my good buddy Ryan Ayers um, had mentioned to me Nate when you guys were recruiting him, and um, it's just been fantastic for me to watch. You know, a, another big that can stretch the floor and is so versatile, and you know, causes so many kind of matchup uh, problems for the opposing defense. So, you know, I've loved uh, loved watching his development. He's having a great year, and you know, couldn't be happier for you know, the way that you guys are playing. Congrats on the big win at, at, at Duke. It sounds like you guys are really catching your stride. So, um, you know, hats off to Nate. You know, he kind of reminds me a lot of myself. And, um, you know, I think he's got a chance to, to continue to get better and better. Well, when he got here as a freshman, a couple of the assistants said, well, you know, he could be like Kurz. I said, well, if he can be like Kurz, I'll take that any day. Because Rob <laughs> Kurz has one saying. hell of a career here. And um, you were one of those guys that, uh, you know, that we've had many of, that it just got better and older and stronger. 
and played your best basketball when you were a junior and senior. You just grew with us and got stronger and learned how to play. Nate has kind of taken a similar path body-wise. You know, he he wasn't uh, – he, he had to gain strength and weight, and he he's certainly done that. Yeah, um, I know you stay in touch with that crew of guys you played with. That was a pretty darn good team. I, I have a lot of flashbacks to your group. And, <laughs> and uh, do you, you stay in touch with those guys and still talk to them? You know, it's fun. Um, I actually stay in touch with a lot of, you know, the guys that came before me. So, you know, Danny Miller and I are good golf buddies. Right. We actually got to play with Matty Carroll and his dad at Philly Cricket this summer. Um, so I'm really fortunate because, you know, I knew Martin when I was 12 years old because he was on my cousin's, you know, high school team. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in this unique position where I've got, you know, a connection to the older guys. And um, it's one of the best things about our program. Um, you know, we have a group chat of like 15 former players that span, you know, from Chris Thomas and Torian Jones to, you know, Danny Miller and Jordan and, and guys that came behind us and Zach and Ryan and, and that whole crew. So um, I think it really is just a testament to the program that you built. And, you know, it's one of the main things that I love about about the school is, you know, we're still to this day. There's some of my closest friends, um, you know, all the guys I played with. So it's really special. You know, it's it, it's interesting, Rob, you talk about, you know, it, I've had 53 guys now over 20 years that have come through. That's a lot of sons that are out there doing their thing and being very successful and now having families and different phases of life. And and you look back and and uh, Jay Billis once said it about our guys about 10 years ago is he said, you know, the great thing about coaching at Notre Dame you can go have a beer with your guys when they're done. And I go, yep, that's the kind of guys we get. We get great guys. And, you know, we've not been able to have the darn reunions because of COVID, but we're going to get back to that because yep. when you guys all come back and you start telling stories, uh, man, are they interesting. Talk about, talk a little bit about your NBA experience. Cause I, I really respected how you kind of scratched and clawed your way to that league and, and and really had a good experience with it. Well, you know, coach, I think I really owe um, a lot of it to you. Cause I remember before um, my junior season, you came up to me and I think the comparison was Shavlik Randolph. Um, and you were like, listen, Rob, you know, if Shavlik can play in the NBA, you know, why can't you? And that should be your goal. And, you know, for me um, having the validation from you, um, you know, really kind of made it like, you know, that was my goal personally. I would never admit to other people. Um, and so I really think that kind of spearheaded me on, okay, let, 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 let's figure out a way to make this happen. Um, you know, my journey was kind of unique. Um, you know, I only probably had 10 pre-draft workouts. Um, I had a great workout with, uh, the Golden State Warriors. I, I, it was probably like the best workout I've ever had. And, you know, Chris Mullen said I was in the mix, um, for the second round pick. And unfortunately they drafted two power forwards. So they took Anthony Randolph in the first round. And they took Richard Hendricks in the second round. And so, you know, the chances of a team, you know, taking three young power forwards, you know, probably wasn't great. So we were trying to figure out what I should do for summer league. And I just kind of had a feeling, you know, I just felt comfortable with the coaching staff. I really enjoyed my experience with Key Smart, um, who did the workout. And so I just said, you know what, let's go to Golden State. You know, they shoot a lot of threes. Um, you know, Coach Nelson is, uh, sorry, I'd say, uh, somebody cutting the lawn back there, but coach Nelson was, you know, kind of one of the pioneers for small ball and floor spacing. Um, right. So I went to summer league. I played well. Thankfully we had uh, two weeks in Vegas and then one week in Utah. So I got three weeks and I got to play a lot. Um, and, you know, at the end of summer league, I was kind of faced with the, de the decision of, you know, do I go to Israel or Italy or go to training camp with no guarantee? And I just said, you know, my dream's never been to play in Europe. My dream is to play in the NBA. Um, so I went to training camp doing the, you know, kind of odds were against me. And I just set weekly goals like, you know, let's make it through the first cut. And then what happened was um, I started to have good practices and Nelly started to pull me aside. And you'd say, like, you know, listen, I want you, you know, to really try to, you know, use your passing ability and get in the lane and, you know, kick out to other people. He's like, it's great that you can make shots. But he's like, you know, help me keep me by, you know, doing some other things. Um, and he really kind of coached me through training camp. And then luckily enough, we had a, uh, a foreign tour to China. And in our last preseason game, 
Um, I started out hot. I hit a couple jumpers in the first quarter, and then I went to the bench and didn't play again until the fourth. And we were in a close game against Milwaukee, and he puts me in with about a minute to go. We're down three. So I hit a three to tie it up. And then Matt Frege came down and hit a jumper to put him up two. And he draws up a play for me at the five. It was like a pin down to come off a screen. And, you know, people really hadn't at that, you know, in my career, hadn't really drawn up plays for me to, you know, <laughs> take the game winning shot. You know, here's my, uh, my NBA career is on the line here. Um, so uh, I ended up making the shot. And then ultimately that kind of propelled me to, you know, to making the team. So I think it was, you know, some good fortune and good luck that really kind of propelled my career. But yeah, I had the, had to take the the hard road because they ultimately, you know, gave Richard Hendricks guaranteed money. Uh, and then they ended up, you know, cutting him to keep me undrafted. So the team ate the money. Um, and, you know, I had a great time playing for Nelly because, you know, he's an offensive genius. So he was constantly putting me in positions to get open shots. And, you know, if I turned down an open shot, he would just pull me out the game. He's like, you're in there to shoot. He's like, I don't care if you miss five in a row. And so, you know, as a shooter, if the coach tells you, like, the worst thing you can do is miss and I'll take you out, you know, he gave me a lot of confidence. So, um, you know, it was a great experience. And I really felt like, you know, the first two, three years of my MBA or my post-playing, you know, college career, I continued to get better, um, which was great for my personal development. You know, you do, you make a great point. You, you kept, you, you weren't at the pinnacle when you left us, you were trending that way and, and they did get you. And that's why you made the team. And I certainly remember you winning the game. We, uh, we watched that as a staff, you know, from uh, where was that in China? It was, it was over, in Beijing. It was in Beijing, right? Where you guys made that. And then you end up making the team and you're, you know, we use you as a, as a role model kind of dog fight. Well, no one drew up plays for you at Notre Dame because Heron Goaty took all the shots. And, oh, and to your tough. credit, you just kept defending and rebounding. My yeah. God, I was lucky to have you. <laughs> no, it was it was so great. I learned so much from you about, you know, spacing and screening. And, you know, I think honestly, the biggest reason why I made the team was, you know, coach said that, you know, I was one of our better rebounders and then one of our better screeners. And so when you have guys like Jamal Crawford that can score the ball against anybody, if you can get them open, you know, they're not the scouting reports not set around me. So if I'm playing a pick and roll with Jamal Crawford, you know, I'm going to be open every time as long as I get to spacing. So um, I was able to play with great players like, you know, Monte Ellis and Steven Jackson. And Ooh. I just got to play off them and shoot, shoot open shots. So it was a lot of fun. Well, it's a little bit like your AAU team, how you played off of Kyle Lowry. I remember watching you in Orlando and I came back and I told the staff, you know, Lowry obviously making every play, making the defense react. I said, Rob Kerr's made every 16 foot open jump shot. And they only have six guys, and they're still winning in Orlando. I said, I love the guy. And, and that's that's where I really fell in love with you. I said, he, he just makes every open 16-footer, and, and you did that for us, too. Um, well, I, I just – it's it's great to catch up with you, Rob. We, we miss you. We're so darn proud of you here. And, um, you know, I may have you talk to Lashevsky and some of these guys – that turn shots down. You know how I am the same way. Like you better shoot it. I'm finally got Cormac Ryan shooting them and not turning shots down the other day. Maybe we can continue to do that. But uh, how's your mom and dad catch us up on mom and dad. Yeah. So, um, you know, dad's, you know, basically semi-retired. He yep. still does some uh, board stuff. You know, they've got a great setup down here. They winter in, uh, in Ocean Reef in Florida. So, you know, they wake up and they play like three sports a day. It's like adult, it's like adult uh, camp here. It's hilarious. <laughs> so, you know, they're great. They love being grandparents, um, but everybody's doing great. They were asking about you and they're, they're sending their love. Well, tell them I miss them. I can still picture them sitting behind the bench, you know, all the parents through the years. And then what was so neat is how the parents then – would go celebrate together or talk to each other after a game and all those bit that was back during those big East venues as we met Carol's and parents and all those parents, the Heron goaties, all of you guys hanging out. Hey, have a great time in Florida. Um, we're going to get you back out here for a little reunion and get you to talk to our team when the, when the coast is clear and we're going to we're going to keep trying to trend up here. We're trending the right way. I think we can finish strong. You guys are playing. You guys are playing really well right now, Coach. Great job with the team, and of course, I'm happy to talk to Nate or any of the guys. And uh, definitely look forward to at the latest seeing you guys um, next fall. And plan to bring the kids and the family out. So, so be 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 uh, be careful. The curse cooler is coming.
the Kerr's gang on a football weekend, I'm ready. I'm ready, and we'll talk about even more. We'll get you and Heron Goaty together. I can't wait to hear the stories from can't the wait. old days. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Thanks for having Take me. Take care of yourself. Right. Take care. Hello to the family. Sounds great, guys. Take care. Thank you. See you, buddy. Welcome back to the Mike Bray Show. Mike, let's take a look at some numbers as we close out this show. The midweek Ken Palm rankings have you with an adjusted offensive ranking of 13. And in your last four games, you have averaged 84 points per game. This veteran team is finally getting into the kind of offensive rhythm I know you thought they would get to at some point in the season. Well, you know, when you play the murderer's row schedule in the non-league, sometimes it's hard to figure yourself out when you're playing against great defenses early. And we had a hard time ever finding a consistent rhythm. Uh, But I think these seven guys now know how to play off of each other on the offensive end of the floor. And they're all doing their job and doing what they, they can do. And, and uh, it's neat to watch. I mean, it's a, it's a group that understands the game offensively and is very unselfish uh, and has the ability to explode offensively, as we've seen. I think that's one of the most important things you have to do as a coach, and, and that is manage perception. A lot of a team's perception is a product of the schedule. I mean, in the first few weeks of the ACC season, you played the top two teams four times. Regrettably, you didn't win any of those games, but it gave people the impression that you were super, super struggling. And part of the struggle was because of who you've played. And Ken Palm says, overall, you've played the 12th toughest schedule in the whole country. Well, we went and put together a heck of a non-league schedule. And then the ACC gave us a heck of a league schedule to start out, you know. And, and so, you know, the problem and the struggle was trying to gain some confidence when you keep you know, getting beat and you can't get into any kind of rhythm. But I give our guys credit. We hung in there, you know, as a staff, we tried to keep teaching and try to keep helping them and try to keep coming at them with some different ideas. And right now we've kind of found a pretty darn good rhythm on both ends of the floor, but our offense is really beautiful to watch. I hope our fans appreciate how we play the right way offensively. And you've won five of your last seven. You've risen to number 57 in the Ken Palm rankings, 66 in the net rankings. Now, I've been among those who are saying, you know what, right now, this season, rest of the season, great foundation for next year. And I know you're going to be really, really good. So good you got me rethinking my decision. No, I'll be watching from afar. But now I'm also thinking there's an opportunity for this team to still make a lot of noise this season. Yeah, we, we uh, I, you know, I'm excited about next year, too, when you add Paul Atkinson to some veterans that have really gotten better. Um, but we want to keep playing. This thing is far from over. Um, we've given ourselves some hope with what we've done the last couple weeks, and our strength of schedule will continue to drag us into a position if we can win enough. And we certainly have games on the schedule Um, quality win opportunities on the schedule left in the regular season before we even get to Greensboro. And you and I both know how we love to play in the ACC tournament, especially in Greensboro. But first, the two-game homestand is next for your team, beginning with a shorthanded but very dangerous Miami team Sunday night at 6 at Purcell. And I know we played well against them in Miami, but you know, they have risen up all of a sudden and beaten a Duke and beaten a Louisville. And, you know, they, they have beaten people. They had Virginia tech flat out beat the other day. So we've got our hands full. And so, you know, it would be a great win for us to, you know, get to six and seven in the league and make it six out of eight wins in this league. Then on Wednesday, you host a Clemson team that already has wins over Purdue, Florida state, Louisville, and North Carolina this season? Well, and the one thing, there, there's one of those up games. You know, their net is high. They're in the 50s. There is one of those that can drag you up into the territory you want to get up. What was it a couple years ago? I said, if you squint real hard, you can see the bubble. I said that uh, after the Boston College game, and people laughed at me. And all of a sudden, after we beat Virginia Tech in the ACC tournament, we were flat on the bubble. Of course, we were the first team out, which was a dagger to the heart. But, you, you know, when you play in a league like ours, it's it's almost never too late. 
uh, at 0 and 5, at 0 and 5, it looked too late. Yeah. But it, but now at five and seven, it's not too late. Mike, as always, thank you. Good luck this week. Thanks. The Mike Bray Show will return at this time next week to break down the Miami and Clemson games and look ahead to a two-game road trip that will take the Irish to Syracuse and Louisville. Until then, for Coach Bray, I'm Jack Nolan. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, everybody. And as always, go Irish. Go Irish.